Um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for the final of what we've called these Vet Camry taster sessions. Um, basically, we really wanted to have Vet Camry last year, but there was a little disease that stopped it. We wanted it again uh, this year, but we couldn't have it in time. Uh, but we wanted you guys still to be aware that Vets Camry is still very much on the horizon, still something very much that we all feel really passionate about uh, having. And so the idea of these sessions is just to give you guys a taster of what to expect, uh, hopefully 17th, the 18th of June 2022. That's the provisional uh, date booked in for, for Vets Camry next year. So it's the final session. So um, thank you to uh, those of you who've been to all sessions. Thank you to those of you just coming to, to this one. It's great, glad to have you with us. Um, so um, in our very first Vets Cymru meeting, we were delighted that Vern Equine Clinic joined us to basically help run um, a day of excellent equine CPD. Uh, and we had hoped to do exactly the same thing the next time. Uh, and we're also gonna use Cots Equine Clinic in Narba. So the two practices we're going to uh, collaborate with us to produce uh, this CPD, uh, and, and that's still the plan. Uh, Tim and I have also been talking about possibly extending it and having a practical element or a half a day practical bolted on just before as well. So that's something that we're exploring. So hopefully something to um, excite you for, for next year. So keep an eye out for that. Um, so for, without further ado, you don't really want to hear me talk too much. Um, so I just want to um, introduce uh, Tim and Luanne. We'll introduce Tim first of all. I know it should be ladies first, but Tim's going to speak first. So I'll introduce Tim first. Uh, so for those of you who were at Vets Camry, you will have met Tim before. Um, Tim qualified from the University of Cambridge in 2007. He then spent three years in mixed practice in Herefordshire and Worcestershire. Subsequently completed an internship at Liphook uh, before joining their ambulatory team. During this time in Liphook, he developed a keen interest in equine surgery and then uh, undertook a residency in equine surgery at the Edinburgh Vet School. While he was there, he undertook specialist training in all aspects of soft tissue and orthopedic surgery with extensive experience of advanced dental procedures and lameness poor performance investigations. In 2017, he was awarded the Certificate Advanced Veterinary Practice in Equine Orthopedics. And in 2018, he became an RCVS and European specialist in equine surgery following completion of the European Diploma in Equine Surgery. He now runs the surgical service at Vernoy Equine Clinic, Shropshire, has a particular interest in lameness, diagnostic imaging, minimally invasive surgery techniques and dentistry. And in a second, Tim's going to talk to us about wounds and managing wounds um, and so we'll come to that in a second, but I just want to introduce Luanne as well, because she may chip in during Tim's talk, or she may actually answer some questions that appear in Q&A uh, as, as we're talking. So Luanne graduated from uh, the RDSVS. Which one's the RD? Oh, that's the same, isn't it? Edinburgh. Yeah, Ed Edinburgh in 2000. Um, undertaken a residency in both equine uh, internal medicine in the USA and large animal surgery in Ireland in addition to a variety of equine veterinary roles in practice. She's a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, has a master's degree in myopathies of warm blood horses, and most recently has undertaken a PhD looking at the potential involvement of fungal mycotoxins in equine grass sickness. She's particularly interested in all aspects of internal medicine and surgery, particularly areas related to gastroenterology, muscle disorders, and intensive care. So I think you'll agree we're in very safe hands with these two. Um, lots of experience there. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is as we have these two sessions, we're going to try and use the question and answers box that some of you have already found. Um, if uh, what we'll try and do is keep the questions to the end, if it's something quite easy and they can answer it themselves whilst you know, the talk's going on, then that may happen. Otherwise, we'll come to questions at the end um, so there's two smaller lectures this evening rather than one big one, um, and hopefully you'll find it very interesting. So, Tim, thank you very much. I'll hand over to you. If you're happy to uh, share your screen, then that would be fantastic. Yeah, how's that work, John? That's great. Thank you very much. I'm Excellent. going to put myself on mute, and then if I need to, I'll just take off to, to speak to you, but otherwise I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks, John, for that 
fantastic introduction. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining Luan and I, um, and I hope we find, um, you know, you find something useful from, from everything that we've, we've got to talk about. So um, th this presentation really, it's about the sort of triage elements of, of a wounded horse, and, and some of it relates to the things that we do in the clinic, but I hope that there's a lot of um, applicability to examination and, and triage of horses um, out on um, on the yard as well. Um, if you're if you're out seeing horses as part of your day to day work. So initially, I, I just want to talk a little bit about examination of the of the wounded horse in general and. The first thing really is the general physical examination. That is an important thing to do. Uh, sometimes the clients think you're mad when there's a huge flap of skin hanging off, you know, the horse's side and you're, you're there listening to its heart and carefully checking its teeth as far as they're concerned. But, you know, it, it, an, it, a, a general physical examination of a horse that's sustained some trauma is an important thing to do. And, you know, perhaps, for the client's point of view, um, you have a quick look at the wounds first and explain what you're doing, but it's, it's definitely something not to neglect. Um, some of these horses have um, lost, lost a little bit of blood. And if you're able to, to quantify that, at least to, to some degree, then, then that's a useful thing to do. Um, obviously in acute blood loss, looking at PCV and, and total protein is, is not that useful, but you may be able to get some information from lactate if that's something that you had available at the practice um, and actually you know can be run horse side if you've got a lactate meter but it is something um, just just to think about anyway and obviously if there's significant hemorrhage then controlling it's useful and that might be with a hemostat following local anesthesia or a press of pressure bandage um, but it, it's a useful thing and if you're referring the horse it's a useful thing to give them some information on as well um, are there any other injuries you know actually very commonly we're faced with a horse that's got a massive wound but actually it might be the tiny wound on the back of the hind pastern that really is the the significant factor that's causing a synovial sepsis or something and you know actually sometimes you go out to these horses and, and the owners hosed all of their legs down they're, they're, they're quite clean and it's quite easy to miss something or they neglect to mention it so Taking a little bit of an inventory with the client, asking are there any other wounds um, is, is important so that we don't miss a, a significant injury. Uh, and obviously careful attention to anatomical location is important. And then knowing a little bit about, you know, equine limb anatomy is, is useful. You're sort of harking back to your first year at vet school, some of this stuff. And, and the more you use it, the easier it is to, to remember like most things, but, but that certainly has a, has a point to play here and, and anatomy is important. Visual examination would be very useful. Sometimes you look into a wound and you can see that a tendon has been exposed, you know, through the length of the tendon sheath. Um, you may also be able to see injured bone or exposed bone. Um, so that's obviously, obviously key um, when, when we're trying to make these assessments and triage the animal. Um, again, digital exploration with a gloved hand. Sometimes you can feel tendon, you can feel fractured bone, etc. Perhaps you can feel cartilage, and then you you know you're convinced that a joint has been entered. Um, radiography obviously can be useful. We'll, we'll come on to these things in a little bit more detail. And ultrasonography also has a place. Um, you know, very useful to to assess extension of joints or damage to cartilage sometimes or bone. Um, and for examination of foreign bodies, black thorns and, and things like that. So obviously it has a, has a part to play. So um, to run through a few complicating factors that can be associated with wound, wounds, and I've sort of put these, well, certainly the first view in, in, in um, degree of importance, I suppose, because fractures ultimately, and it's such a common presentation with horses, they're life-threatening injuries potentially. You know, synovial sepsis certainly could be considered life-threatening. It's definitely limb-threatening. But it is also important to think about tendon or ligament damage, possibly also vascular damage, which um, whilst perhaps they're not quite as dramatic as, as a fracture or a synovial sepsis, they can have a significant bearing on the, on the horse's prognosis and on the client's likelihood of pursuing further treatment and, and that sort of thing as a result. So 
there are some cases that I've experienced where, where that's certainly come into play and a few of them are included later on. Thoracic penetration obviously can be, you know, very, very serious. It's important to, um, to, to think about. And abdominal penetration occasionally occurs um, in horses. Um, I've, I've seen it with hedging stakes and things like that. Um, so there can be gastrointestinal injury as well, which can be, you know, potentially catastrophic. And it's important that we identify that. So fractures... Um, obviously are extremely important um, to identify them and, and particularly in the long bones. I've got a few long bone fractures for, for you to have a look at um, later on um, that are associated with wounds and, and they have a significant bearing. If you've got fractured bone and a synovial sepsis that is that has been shown to affect the prognosis and the likelihood of um, a successful treatment. So it's, it is very important to identify those things and if you've got x-ray available um, and you're looking at the horse at the clinic or maybe out on, on, on the yard, it is, it is a useful thing to do. Um, or at least examine the horse with, a, with, a, with fractures in mind anyway. Um, this, um, I, th I hope you can see that okay. I'll just make sure my face isn't in the way. This uh, image on the right-hand side, this was an accessory carpal bone fracture. And this was a racehorse actually um, and sustained a wound um, in conjunction. Um, and this was actually reasonably difficult to diagnose um, but with careful palpation it, it was possible and then obviously radiography was confirmatory. This is an important one actually this is a radial fracture and these are not uncommon after kick kick injuries and the, the sort of medial aspect of the horse's radius is reasonably vulnerable to to kick injuries that you get a flailing hoof that comes across the horse's body and, and catches them on the inside and they can get these little um epiphyseal star fractures i hope you can see my mouse here but through the growth plate at, at that level um, you can sometimes see a little star fracture that forms and then you get these spiraling lines that extend up up the bone. Now at this point this fracture is minimally displaced um, and, and actually this is a, a salvageable situation but if a radial fracture displaces then you know unfortunately that's catastrophic certainly for an adult horse and, and probably for a foal. But if you're able to identify this um, and that may be through percussion of the radius or just based on sort of clinical suspicion I actually quite like if a horse has sustained a kick or a wound to that area um, to, to make sure we get some of these radiographs and do our best to prove or disprove the presence of a fracture. But it's an important one to identify because that could be managed conservatively. Moving on now from fractures really to synovial involvement. Um, sometimes it's very easy to demonstrate synovial involvement. This poor horse had a chronic tendon sheath sepsis and when it presented to us you flex the limb and all this pus came pouring out onto the onto the clinic floor. Um, I mean, fortunately, they don't present to us like that very often, um, but that, that was not a good outcome for that poor pony. Normally, we have to work a little bit harder to demonstrate synovial involvement. Um, and obviously, as, as I'm sure you're aware, synovial centesis, hopefully at a point remote from the wound, um, is, a, is a very useful um, way of demonstrating this. And again, this is where anatomy comes into play. Knowing a little bit about your joint pouches, perhaps if there's a wound on the dorsal aspect of the limb, can I approach this from the palmar or plantar aspect? Um, sometimes that's, that's not possible and we just have to do the best we can in the circumstances. Um, and hopefully we're gonna recover a, a sample of synovial fluid, which we can analyze look at the total nucleated cell count, total protein, possibly the neutrophil uh, differential count and determine if we think sepsis is, is likely. This is a, um, a case, this, this image of the horse's pastern, um, I might come to in just a moment actually, we'll, we'll, we'll move through, talk about collected samples, cytological examination and culture and sensitivity is an important one. It can be a bit 50-50, but I do like to get a sample away either in a swab or you can use culture broths um, to try and increase your likelihood of uh, recovering a bacteria. The problem is if you wait, first of all, the horse will have, have had a lot of antibiotics. You reduce your chances of um, obtaining a, an isolate. 
Um, and also you're losing time. You know, you, it takes the best part of a week till you get those cultural results back. And if the case is going south, it's really useful information to have earlier rather than later. And if you can't get a sample or if there's any doubt about synovial involvement, distension with sterile saline or a contrast medium can be useful. And in this case, we've got a wound right over the horse's pastern. And what I've done is I've distended the joint via that needle um, and was able to achieve very good distent, um, distension of the joint. When I remove my syringe, you can see that we've got high pressure um, fluid flow back through the needle, but there's no egress through the wound. And I would almost always put a concurrent antimicrobial in there. I normally use amikacin, but you can use others. Gentamicin stings the horse a bit more, but um, you know it's a reasonable thing to put into a joint um, as a belt and braces approach. Um, and on that basis, you may then be considering referral. Um, or before that, if, if you're not happy, perhaps conducting some of those procedures um, on the premises you're on. Um, I just wanted to um, run through on this image here. So I'm just trying to move things around a little bit on my screen. Let's see if I can do that. Um, some of the real areas where these, these things get missed. Um, and the first one, you know, distal limb. If you've got wounds in this area, very easy for navicular bursa, coffin joint, tendon sheath, um, past and joint to be involved. So there's, there's, if you've got wounds in that area, assume there's synovial involvement until it's proved otherwise, really. Um, hocks are another one. You know, there's, there's four tarsal joints and then you've got the very complicated anatomy of the calcaneal bursae. There's three of those in most horses in each leg, um, which in the majority of cases communicate with one another over the point of the hock. And there's the tarsal sheath carpal sheath in the, in the forelimb as well. Wounds and the sort of proximal uh, one third of the antibrachium, you'd think they're miles from the elbow joint, you know, the point of the elbows up here, but it's quite common for wounds at this level to enter the elbow joint. And it's something that gets missed. You think it's quite innocuous, but again, that's an area where I, I'm always sort of slightly wary that could we have an elbow joint sepsis here? And finally, over the point of the shoulder, shoulder sepsis is, you know, fortunately uncommon, but it's not impossible. But wounds in that area aren't uncommon when a horse has run into something and you have got the bicipital bursa there, which can, um, can become septic. So again, keep an eye out if you have a wound like that. Um, just a couple of examples here. I hope you can see that okay. Um, the image on the Left hand side, um, this was a heel bulb laceration that we repaired and we stapled the hoof. We actually had this horse in a hoof cast, which is a lovely way of managing these. The image on the right hand side is, is a, a wound over the point of the hock. Now, that in, in most horses will enter the subcutaneous calcaneal bursa, and that may or may not then communicate with the other calcaneal bursae. But again, you know, wounds in that location do, do think about synovial sepsis. A uh, few more examples, image on the right, I would be really concerned about bicipital bursa sepsis um, in this case, potentially shoulder. Um, and then the other two images, one of them, two different horses, one of them was a um, you know, wound over the palmar or plantar aspect of the, the fetlock and cannon region, and very close to the proximal pouch of the tendon sheath there. And then the other one was a a horse I operate on at Fernway, wound right through the back of the, um, the sort of fetlock region, and that had a septic digital flexor tendon sheath, which we um, lavaged arthroscopically and repaired. Um, and if they're treated promptly, they have a good, a really good prognosis. So um, the, these are, you know, probably not something you're going to attempt on, on the yard because you, you don't have a team to help you x-ray the horse and you probably don't have any contrast with you, I, I almost certainly imagine. But they're quite nice examples of you know, what we're trying to achieve actually with sterile saline. So if we can get a needle into a joint, we can distend it with saline. Um, and, and this is essentially what we're trying to achieve. This is a horse um, on the left-hand side with a wound that I think you can see again, my, my arrow here, but you can see the wound on the back of the 
fetlock and actually you can see I've distended the tendon sheath with contrast medium and there's nothing egressing from the wound but that horse is, is extremely lucky. Another one in the middle here with a, a wound on the front of the um, of the radius and not too far away really from the radio or anti-brachiocarpal joint here so you can see all these pouches extending around here so again probably quite another another lucky horse. Um, and, and then finally here, um, I've distended the, the calcaneal bursi with some um, contrast medium, but you can appreciate where the bursi are. You can see the SDFT and, and calcaneal tendon running through here, the gastroc tendon is. Um, this horse doesn't communicate with the subcutaneous calcaneal bursa, which is in this region here. Um, but this is one that, that we did a contrast study with and did have a have a synovial sepsis. So you can see from that proximal pouch, we have got egress of the contrast medium running out through the wound and then trickling down over, over the ergot. So we proved in that case, we did have this sort of pinprick communication um, with, with the joint. Um, I, I want to move along sort of fairly swiftly, just in the interest of time, but this is a lovely book. Um, if you, it fits in your glove compartment, it's great for all the sort of joint pouches and the nerve blocks and things like that. Um, a couple of sort of sequelae here to um, wounds. This is a horse with a, a sequestrum, very sort of classic example. We've got um, the, the, inv the involucrum, this sort of dense, um, rim of bone around the sequestrum with the sort of lucent air in the middle and then the sequestrum itself um, in the center periosteal new bone forming here um, and then this was the sort of post-operative um, x-ray we did this standing removed some of the, the overlying bone and, and removed that sequestrum so that was quite a satisfying outcome um, and sequestra tend to occur when you have a lot of damage to the periosteum because of the blood supply from the periosteum um, into the cortical bone. You, you get these devitalization of, of parts of the bone. Um, and these kind of wounds are, are the ones where, where that can happen. Um, this, this also just shows that the nice progression in this case over a couple of weeks of granulation and, and sort of second intention wound healing. But if you had a, a case like this, where this wound at this point then failed to heal, and you had perhaps discharge, certainly wound failure, two, four, six weeks post injury, um, you may think it's a question and think, should I, should I radiograph this horse and just check what we're dealing with? Just as an aside, you know, when, when we're treating these horses in the clinic, one of the things we can do is, is drill into the exposed bone and we think that does stimulate um, the, the, the healing um, and, and blood flow into, into that cortical bone, probably protect the, the wound flap as well. Um, tendon ligament involvement is, is really important to, to, to bear in mind because it can have a huge effect on, on prognosis really. So if flexor tendons are injured, suspensory ligaments are injured, you know, that, that is a serious injury for that horse potentially. Extents of tendons less so. Um, and, and a lot of those horses can do very well, even with medical management, actually, perhaps a little bit of debridement or something. But do bear in mind external coaptation with some of these cases. And you can always ask the referral centre if, if you want some advice on how to travel that horse. But this poor horse had an extent, complete extensor tendon rupture and it traveled about three hours to us. This is when I was in Edinburgh and um, it had a very light bandage on and it was traveling basically on the end of its cannon bone for that period. And then we think that there was a lot of vascular injury all around the, the leg. And unfortunately, what happened was that over time all of all of the skin and actually the hoof began to slough and as a result we ended up euthanizing that horse although you know the treatment to that point had, had gone quite well there'd obviously been such severe damage to to the, the vasculature that it had these consequences I'm probably a little bit getting a little bit short of time but I'll just run through as many slides as I can, I can manage this was a horse that had a collateral ligament in the past and um, joint and, and that ligament had been almost completely severed um, and, and it only became apparent really when we had the horse on the table but actually as a result we did euthanize that horse but it just shows the importance of, um, of these soft tissues in some of these cases. 
Um, slightly, slightly funny and quelly this, I don't know if you've ever seen one, they're very classic when you see one, subcutaneous emphysema after a wound, they tend to be in the axillary um, or over the pectoral region, but the horses inflate like literally like a balloon, huge amount of gas under the skin. Um, and we need to treat those with um, achieving wound closure, um, antibiotics, pain relief, potentially rest to try and minimize air ingress. But it is a slightly, slightly funny condition um, that can occur following wounds in that region. Um, so moving a little bit on to treatment of the wound and I'll, John, I think I'm all right for just a couple of minutes, maybe. Yeah, good. Um, I've, I've got a few more slides that, that will be available to you, I'm sure. But antimicrobials are likely to be important. non steroidals will have a part to play. Do think about tetanus prophylaxis. Um, clipping is, is a useful thing to do. Pack the wounds, you know, KY jellies. Um, quite useful into, into the wound to um, to prevent hair getting into the into the site. Ideally, don't try not to get too much soap into the wound itself um, if you can, but certainly you can clean the, the adjacent skin. And one of the take-home messages I will say: when you're doing some of these treatments, stitch-ups, um, synovia centesis to prove joint sepsis, do think about local anaesthesia because it can really help hugely. And if you can get adapt at doing, um, for example, on a baxial sesamoid nerve block. If you've got a wound over a pastern or the coffin joint, then you've got a, a much better chance of getting a tap from that and it will help with stitch ups and things like that. So they can really help your investigation. Um, debridement, um, I'll just sort of rattle through this really. Surgical debridement is, is, is a very useful thing to do. Sharp debridement, obviously we've got to be careful a little bit with vital structures. Mechanical debridement, if you've got a very contaminated wound, then that might may simply be with clean running water. And that's a, that's a very reasonable thing to do in the early stages. I, I really like chemical debridement and I use a, I just make this up with, with salt and, and water, but a 20% hypertonic saline solution. If you, if you put that onto a heavily contaminated wound for 12 hours, really saturated bandage it will make a massive difference to the appearance of that wound and I think that's a, a useful thing to do um, we won't dwell too much on maggots but they can be used um, there's, a, there's a few slides here on, on wound management which I think I'll probably um, omit so I can click through them John but perhaps we're, we'll look to move on to questions um, excellent well I, I'm sure a lot of this is familiar to, to any of you who are dealing with wounds regularly um, one, one thing I will say is just a final perhaps take home message. If you've got a significant skin defect, I do try and preserve the, the flap if I have any option to do so. The, this eyelid laceration is, 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 is an obvious one. We really want to pr preserve the, the eyelid margins. Um, you can have consequences of that sometimes as well as a corneal ulcer, which links nicely with Luann's um, presentation. Um, but you obviously, that, that's, that's a, a must repair really. But this wound can be helped hugely, even if it just acts as a biological bandage for a few days and you save five millimetres of tissue around the wound margins, that will reduce the, the time that that wound takes to heal um, significantly. And you can see, you know, it would be tempting perhaps to just leave this. I'd be worried about sequestering formation, but over a couple of weeks, we got all the stitches out and, and it healed very nicely, protected that bone. There's another one there. This was a horse that we managed in a, in a, a bandage cast post-operatively, nasty fetlock laceration. So we put some tension relieving sutures in and, and protected that wound and allowed it to heal. That also had a, a fetlock sepsis. Um, another one um, with a with a carpal joint um, sepsis and, and a nasty wound. Again, we managed this in a in a bandage cast, and, and that did very well. But you can see that I am trying to preserve the tissue, even if it does break down subsequently. We're, we're going to probably have some gains. Um, and external coaptation is is something um, that, that is extremely important and does help if you're referring a horse as well. If if you put a nice bandage on like that multi-layer bandage, if you've got the material in the car, when it arrives at the clinic, you often have a less swollen limb, probably a less painful horse. 
and it makes further investigation um, a lot more comfortable. And as I discussed, you know, there can be certain unstable limbs that really, really require that degree of external coaptation. That's a little hot uh, cast, which again has application probably for a hospitalized source. Um, I'll, I'll leave uh, that slide for your, your information. It's just discuss factors that can impair healing. Um, and really there, I think I'll draw to a close. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, really concise. And uh, Kate, straight in with a question. I don't know if you can see that one there, but uh, I'll read it out to you. Um, we're often dealing with lower limb wounds in a stable or a field. Would you generally advocate delayed primary healing? Um, it's uh, yeah, it's a, a good a good question, um, Kate. And I sort of I kind of glossed over it a little bit there. But as as Kate rightly says, you know you've got delayed primary healing, whereby you're looking to if anyone's unfamiliar with it, you've got sort of primary healing where we, we we suture the wound for example and then we've got delayed primary and delayed secondary healing and then the difference between those two is really whether that wound is in the process of granulating so delayed secondary healing is when you're um when you've really got granulation that's forming in that wound and, and you then subsequently sort of try and repair that um delayed primary healing is really where you sort of try and clean that wound up a little bit and then close it um, and yeah, it's, it's a good question because every case, and that's what's quite nice about these sort of wounds and things like that, actually, they're all slightly different. And you may have a very clean um, situation, really. Um, but I, I definitely think there's no harm in, you know, doing some first aid measures, treating the horse for 12 or 24 hours, going back to visit the following day, maybe when it isn't nine o'clock at night. Um, and you've got a few, few more bits of equipment or some people to help you and think about your local anesthesia. And maybe at that point, you've got a cleaner wound um, that you can then repair primarily um, and has a better chance of healing. So I think it's a very, very reasonable um, suggestion. Um, I think, I mean, things I use, I talked about um, hypertonic saline. I use quite a lot of honey. Um, you know, even if you just lavage that wound, bandage it, reduce a bit of swelling, as I say, you might find that the whole situation is a little bit easier um, the following day. Does that answer your question, Kate? I'm sure it does. Yeah, thanks very much, Tim. One, one thing I was just interested in, you, um, you said about the sequestra when there's damage to the um, periosteum. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the clinic, you said that you, you drill into the bone um what what could the guys do in practice um if they're worried that that's might that that might happen is there anything they can anything else they can do if they're worried there's a big chance of a sequester developing yeah you know another good good question i think the, dri the drilling into the bone is a little bit of a technical thing but it is just something that, that i don't know jogs your memory and makes you think about sequester a little bit it's not necessarily a technique i would always jump to but I think that the best thing that you can do if you've got exposed bone is try and cover it, you know, get, get the skin back, the tissues back together over the bone. So if there's any way of achieving that in the case, you've, you, you will then have moisture, you know, in the tissues over the bone. And I think you're much less likely to have a sequester if, if that's the case, a sequestrum, sorry. Um, the, other, the other thing also is just to, you know, actually mention it to the client, you know, it's not going to be your fault if a sequestrum occurs, but if you've warned them at the point that the, the wound originally occurred, um, you know, this horse could be at risk of a sequestrum, and then that subsequently um, proves to be the case. Well, it sort of shows that you know what you're talking about, but it's an important complication if the wound's not healing that, you know, they're more likely to give you a call back. I think, if, if they're concerned. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I think we will, we will move it along to Luanne. So thanks very much, Tim. Um, fantastic uh, session as always. Um, and hopefully a, a good taster for everybody. So Tim Thank is you. also going to share the slides for Luanne. So I'll just give him an opportunity just to, um, to, no. to do that. Um, and then whenever you're ready, 
Joanne, again, if you've got any questions, if you want to type them in as we go, because you want to remember them, you, you know, at a certain point, please feel free to type them in uh, and then we will come to them at the end. Um, we'll have a bit of time for questions and answers again at the end. So over to you, Luanne. Thanks very much. Hey, evening, everybody. Um, I hope we've all had a good day. Uh, so this is my, my first talk um, for everybody. And I've, I've recently joined Fernway in um, January. So I'm kind of um, sort of match replacement, I suppose. You might be a familiar face to many. But anyway, tonight I'm going to speak about the management of corneal ulcers. Um, I too probably have quite a few slides and maybe too many, but there is a lot of information on the slides. So I may not talk about it all directly. Um, some of that is it for your information only, but certainly if there's any questions in relation to that, that I skim over for time constraints, then please feel free to ask questions along the way. So just a little um, summary of what I'm going to try and talk about tonight. So just a brief overview of corneal anatomy and function and not too much detail, but mainly uh, the thing that's important here is how that sort of relates to uh, healing and also treatment and what considerations you might need to think about. Um, also a discussion about diagnostic testing and, and you know, what sort of tests you might want to perform to best assess um, a corneal ulcer. Uh, and that will obviously determine the best treatments. And then I'm just gonna go on at the end and discuss a little bit about uh, mainly medical treatment um, and just touch on a little bit of surgical options uh, that, are, that are available as well to the more sort of complex, um, relevant to more complex ulcers. Change the slide, please, Tim. Sorry, I forgot to ask. Thank you. So if we just look initially um, at some corneal anatomy, not too much detail for a Thursday evening, but um, just in relation, first of all, to the rest of the structures of the eye. And I think the first thing to note is it's obviously, it's got quite a prominent position right at the front of the eye. And unfortunately that means it's also quite prone to injury. But the main thing that I wanted to highlight here, I suppose, is it's a transparent tissue. It doesn't have a lot of, uh, or there aren't a lot of actual blood vessels in the cornea itself. Um, it has a key function really in transmitting that light from the front of the eye to the back. So it's really, really important that the transparency is kind of maintained. Uh, it does, however, have a very rich nerve supply, at least the superficial parts. And this is mainly from your trigeminal nerves. Uh, but interestingly, actually, that decimus membrane, which is the deeper structure within the cornea, doesn't actually have any nerves at all. So I suppose the take home message from this is you can't always relate extent of pain to depth of ulcer. OK, so just to touch base and home in on the cornea a little bit more, uh, I suppose there's mainly four layers and each kind of have their own individual function. Um, there is this tear film, which I'm going to come back to because I need to talk a little bit more about that. But the, it's probably this first layer is this stratified epithelium. This is kind of like your first barrier, really, in my eyes, that um, as a protective barrier. Then you move on to this stroma, which is makes up about 90% of your cornea uh, and moving deeper still, you get to this very, very important decimus membrane, which I'm sure we're all familiar with across all species. Um, and then innermost of this, you've got this last one layer thickness before you go into anterior chamber, chamber. And this is this inner endothelium. And this is quite important as well from the point of view of maintaining this transparency of the cornea, because actually this is where this little pump sits and this actually maintains this corneal transparency. So if you get um, any inflammation or disease or anything like that that affects this pump, this is where you're, you're gonna get this corneal edema effect and this bluey tinge to the eye. If you can change the slide, please, Tim. So actually, if you look at the thickness of the cornea, it's actually not very thick at all. And this is quite scary when you put it into perspective. Centrally, uh, it's about one to one and a half millimeters thick. And around the edge, uh, it's only about 0.8 millimeters thick. So that's actually quite scary sometimes when you actually start to 
Um, think about um, keratectomies and things like that, but just to give you an idea. And just to talk a little bit more specifically before we move on to uh, sort of diagnostics and things, this pre-corneal tear film is really, really important. It's really mucin rich, um, which has mainly got this protective role, um, but it, it's really, really important in maintaining not only protection, but just kind of the health of the cornea. It's obviously gonna give you this smooth surface. Uh, it provides nutrition. It's got lots of other things in like these proteinases or anti inhibitors um, of proteinase action, growth factors and also cytokines. And these are really, really important when it comes when you come to look at uh, injury and actually trying to prevent um, actually almost like self harm or damage to the eye when these inflammatory mediators that get triggered within uh, an inflamed eye. Uh, that trigger these kind of proteinases and they actually go on um, and actually cause damage themselves. So I'll talk about that a little bit in a bit more detail. Uh, if you can change, oh yeah, thanks Tim. Um, so these proteinases are probably the most important film, but the important feature really of your uh, tear film. And these kind of have these housekeeping um, sort of function where is this natural turnover of damage, you know, sort of cells or old cells, etc. Obviously, what they do do or are also involved in is kind of repairing damaged cells and collagen tissue as well. And probably the two main ones are these matrix and caloproteinases, and also these serine proteinase neutrophil elastase, which Forgive me, I'm actually going to um, short, put them in a shorthand from here on because they're just a bit of a mouthful. So basically what happens is your corneal epithelial cells, also some fibroblasts within your stroma and also some white blood cells. Uh, in the presence of pathogens, these will kind of upregulate this tear film or these tear film cytokines, which are effectively these inflammatory mediators. And these will go on and really, really strongly um, stimulate these uh, or upregulate these matrix metalloproteinases and these um, neutrophil elastases. And these are the ones actually that have these really, really powerful inflammatory effects within the eye. But sadly, also, um, it's almost like this self perpetuating cycle of degradation as well, so that they will actually go on and cause direct damage to the cornea as a result of being triggered. So it's not just the presence of infection, is the point I'm trying to make. So moving on to the ophthalmic exam, Tim has already touched on this, but the same thing applies to any system really. Um, the history is really, really important. It's, it's good to know how long, uh, when, when did this start? How long has it been going on? Does this horse, for example, have any pre-existing conditions, for example, like uveitis, that actually might complicate the overall picture of this? Um, so always good to know, and you can kind of get a lot of information actually just by looking at the animal and taking this history before even examining them. And again, what I mean by that is just the general appearance of the eye. Is the cornea clear? Is it smooth? Is the horse comfortable? Are the eyes symmetrical? What is the what are the surrounding structures like? For example, like the eyelids, are they swollen? Um, is the eye moving normally? Or is, you know, is the horse holding it in an abnormal position? An eyelash position in the horse can tell you an awful lot about how, one, how normal the eye is, but two, how comfortable that horse is. And the reason I've put this picture here is just to remind me of that, is this normal sort of eyelash position in the horse. Not quite um, sort of horizontal, but slightly tilted down from the horizontal. If you have a horse that's very, very painful, then generally speaking, that eye, eyelash position will become more steep and they will point downwards or more downwards towards the floor. Obviously, alongside that as well, you know, does this does this horse look like it has a painful eye? For example, um, you know, is there any discharge? Is the horse clamping the eye shut? Is the eye kind of more protruding or is it actually shrunken back into the head? So all kind of good things and a lot of information that you can gain um, before you even start to examine the eye. Okay, thanks, Tim. So I've put this slide up to remind myself, obviously to do a good um, ophthalmic exam in relation to um, looking at a, or examining a corneal ulcer. 
you are going to need some kind of ophthalmoscope or some sort of transom in nature. And generally speaking, the setting that gives you a good focus for the cornea is about 20 green. But this can vary a little bit according to what your individual eyesight is. But the main reason I've put this slide up is just to remember that um, horses in general anyway will be quite awkward. They just, just don't like you generally shining bright lights in their eyes, even normally. So if you then have a horse that's really, really painful, you can imagine they're probably not going to be very amenable. So don't be afraid to use sedation, which I'm sure we all do. But also don't be afraid to do some basic nerve blocks. And there are probably a couple really that are really, really helpful and will actually enable you to get a much better look inside this horse's eye. Uh, and probably, so the first one is um, the one kind of nearest to the text on the left. This is the supraorbital nerve block. Uh, this has like a sensory function to the upper kind of two thirds of your upper eyelid. And then on the right, your auricular palpebral one, which is a, a, a motor, uh, has motor function. And this is going to obviously, you know, kind of um, control eye, eyelid movement. So if you can do these two nerve blocks, and they're really, really easy to palpate. Um, first of all, just along the orbital rim, uh, coming from sort of the cordial as aspect of the eye and moving forwards, if you move your two fingers um, along that orbital rim and move forwards and drop it down. There's like a natural depression where that supraorbital nerve kind of uh, emerges. And it's just where that orbital rim at the point where it starts to actually widen. Uh, and equally, if you follow um, the rim of the, of the bone up from the eye, just towards the ear, you can actually just palpate the auricular palpebral nerve along that rim, just lightly under your fingers, about halfway up. Uh, on the edge of that or that that bony rim there so they're both really really easy to do so just don't forget to do them because they will help immensely was the, the main point I wanted to make okay thanks Tim the other thing that I wanted to highlight as well when you're looking at a horse with an ulcer is um, don't be afraid to do um, you know take some swabs and do some cultures because this can actually again help immensely when it comes to um, sort of targeting treatment or what, which, which treatment is best. And it's always best done before you kind of start treatment because, you know, if, if you've already had some medication or some treatment on board, then that could potentially complicate things. So if you do think you might be dealing with something slightly more complex than just say, a, you know, a simple superficial ulcer, then maybe just take a minute and try and take a swab. Um, if we're talking specifically about ulcers and ones that might need some sort of debridement, this is this can give you a lot of information because cytology, again, as this these pictures are showing, um, if you actually take a little scrape of something that looks like slightly melting, um, if you if you even just do like a basic H and E stain, um, you know you don't have to be an expert in cytology or looking down a microscope to see that. This one on the left, there's actually fungal hyphae there that should scream alarm bells uh, if you see that. I mean, it doesn't look like any type of bacteria you're going to see down a microscope. So it doesn't matter what type of fungi it is. It's just good to know that you've got fungal elements in there. But equally, you know, you can just get an idea potentially of what type of bacteria that you might be dealing with as well, which might help you kind of target which antibiotic you might select to treat the ulcer. Um, and this can be done relatively easily with just some topical anesthesia. And you can either use like a swab or you can also use, um, you know, like the blunt side of a blade just to take a little scraping as well and pop it on a side. And it's actually in a sedated horse with your nerve blocks in place with some topical anesthesia and things like that. It's not as scary as it might for, you know, it might first seem. So always good to do uh, if you think you might be dealing with something a little bit more complicated. Obviously, I'm pretty sure everybody uh, going out to look at a horse with a corneal ulcer is going to, you know, more than likely stain at the eye. And I suppose that fluorescein dye is fairly routine across the board. Uh, obviously, if you get this uptake of stain, that's telling you you've got like a full thickness epithelial defect in the cornea. So basically, that at least that first layer has gone. Um, you can also get these slightly confusing or, or sort of vague uptakes of um, your fluorescein where you're never really sure if it's a positive or a negative. And 
a lot of them really are, are more like they're not full thickness um, defects. They're more kind of like abrasions um, or where you've got some possibly even inflammation between the epithelial cells in that first layer of the cornea. So you can almost get like these. Um, it's almost like a, a brush effect rather than a distinct uptake. So I would still call them positive. Um, and also as well, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, sometimes some of these more complex ulcers in the initial stages can just present as vaguely painful, but not directly positive on the fluorescein uptake. So just beware, if you see something like that, it might be an early alarm bell of something more complex, but only in the early stages. And equally, if you do have the opportunity to have any rose bengal dye in the clinic, um, and this is something that's a little bit scarce, actually, you can't always get hold of it that easily, but um, sometimes it's like a secret hoard somewhere in one of the, some of these older practices and somebody will whip some out. So if you can just keep even just, you know, a, a couple of kind of strips in there to do this, and then it's really, really useful to do, um, because quite often in, in particular reference to these fungal ulcers, they often will be negative on a fluorescein um, staining, but they'll be positive on rose bengal. So again, if you've got maybe a, a horse that's slightly more painful, then you can actually piece together by doing this examination. It might, this might be one to actually do a, red, you know, a rose bengal dye um, test on. Okay, next um, slide, Tim, thank you. And this probably just reiterates what, what I just said. Um, sometimes some of these kind of minor just lesions, um, just with, with mild pain can just be, you know, these very, very early cases. And actually, these will be the ones that will surprise you and go on to become full blown melting ulcers within a few days. So just beware. And the reason I put this um, image up is to show you, this is actually of a case we had in the hospital um, a few months ago now. Um, and this is how she initially presented. So whilst it's a fairly substantial sized ulcer that's definitely positive with fluorescein. Her initial presentation actually had been of that sort of not really a positive fluorescein uptake at all. She just had sort of a slightly more, you know, slightly painful eye, wasn't quite right, but she looked more painful than you would imagine from staining her cornea and seeing that she didn't really have a proper ulcer. But this over the space of about three days progressed to about day two, this also this this image in this um, slide here, and I'll go on and show you some more sequential images of how this horse progressed over the space of time. So next slide, Tim, please. So just a little recap, um, these ulcers that uh, are melting, this can be a really, really rapid process. And just going back to these tear film proteinases, um, that can produce these, you know, these kind of melting or uh, destructive enzymes. So this can be slightly twofold. If you have got infection in an eye, not only can these bacteria and fungi produce these um, collagenase enzymes, the tear film proteinases, um, and also like your neutrophil or your white blood cell um, reaction within your tear film will trigger this really, really strong uh, reaction. And what you can end up with is exactly this. You get this um, almost like this liquefying uh, gloopy material um, on the surface of the cornea that seems to be kind of melting down their face. So this should be, I'm, I'm sure this, this seeing this eye actually would set alarm bells off for most people, to be honest. Um, so this is obviously something that you don't want to see. Um, and it's obviously also an indication that you need to get quite sort of um, drastic with your treatment. OK, next slide, Tim, please. Another thing that's quite interesting and another and the reason I've put this slide up is this is actually the same horse that I showed you a picture of uh, a couple of slides ago. Um, and this is kind of how her also went on to heal at various stages. But this was just to really reiterate, don't panic if you see this really, really um, marked kind of vascularization of the cornea coming in. It's almost like a second skin coming over the cornea and looking like this horse is never going to have a normal eye again. Uh, you almost get this quite, horses like to have this really, really marked um, corneal vascularization that happens with healing, but also fibrosis as well. 
So I just wanted to put this up to show you because I think this is a really, really nice picture that looks pretty horrendous. But I will show you how this horse's eye goes on uh, and progresses to heal. Um, so it's supposed to be a po give you a, a positive indication of if you see this of what can actually happen. So moving on to treatment of corneal ulcers, hopefully most of these uh, ulcers that you will see in the field uh, will just be considered, um, you know, like the superficial type that will just heal with just field management. Uh, and I think the main things really when you're treating um, all corneal ulcers is, I kind of think of this in, in three ways. You need to treat the actual ulcer itself. I think something that's often forgotten about but is really, really important and will have re sort of knock-on effects for how well this, or how quickly, but also what the cosmetic outcome might be of a horse having an ulcer, and that is to also control the uveitis. And last but not least is also to manage the pain aspect, largely as a, as a result, actually, of this horse having the uveitis. So it's kind of a... Um, a three approach. I always think of this, in, you know, as, as three separate areas. There's the ulcer, treating the ulcer itself and what's causing that, um, but also managing the, the marked uveitis um, that all horses get like a reflex uveitis. As soon as anything, any sort of trauma, pain, anything happens in the eye, they will always get uveitis. And that is equally as important to treat as well. And as a result of that, you need to manage the pain accordingly. Because if you can manage the pain, this will actually help control the uveitis because they are very, very much linked in the horse. So you can look at the size of your ulcer, the depth of the ulcer. Um, have you got any um, vascular response within the cornea already? What is the pupil size doing? And this is really, really important and can give you uh, a lot of information from the point of view of uveitis. If you've got a really, really um, constricted pupil and you can barely see through it, then obviously that horse has got you know quite a significant degree of uveitis going on. Uh, and also the amount of tearing and blepharospasm that a horse has can give you a good indication. Not necessarily of corneal depth, sorry, of ulcer depth, remember, but probably also that, that pain may relate more to the degree of uveitis in the eye than it does actually corneal depth. So most of these will hopefully be cases that you can treat with, just with topical antibiotics, et cetera, but just also be aware, as I'm sure you all are, that there are actually better systems or systems that are gonna help you deliver drugs to a horse that, let's just say a horse um, isn't the easiest to manage ordinarily. If you then add in the fact that it has an incredibly painful eye and you're gonna be wanting to put, you know, frequent applications of drugs into there, it becomes a bit of a nightmare. And sometimes actually, even some horses will tolerate this for 24 hours and then they just com get completely fed up. So you end up with a no-win situation because actually if you can't get any drugs into the eye, um, it's just gonna become really, really difficult to resolve um, any corneal ulcer really, even a simple one. So don't be afraid to use um, these lavage systems. And obviously you can get these nice subpalpebral lavage kits that come um, with, with instructions. You can actually kind of make your own. And this is what a lot of people end up doing. So it's worth considering, even if you don't have one of these fancy um, kind of Myla, you know, SPL kits, you can actually get some um, extension tubing, fenestrate it yourself and actually use that um, as a lavage system. So it is, it is doable, and I have been in that position myself where we haven't had a lavage system, so you can make your own. You can place like a lavage system in the upper or the lower eyelid, but it's really, really important if you're going under the upper eyelid to get them high enough underneath that conjunctival fornix. And obviously, if you're going in the lower lid, then quite often you can use your third eyelid, um, you know, as a, as a sort of protection between that and the cornea. Um, don't forget to protect the eye with any ulcer against not only trauma and a lot of horses will scratch, but also light. Um, and you can buy some really, really nice eye cups to do this, but you can also get quite, quite good at improvising. For example, we had a horse recently that it's amazing what you can do with bras and cups. So all I'm saying is you can improvise, you can go out and you can buy things to actually improvise before you can get a proper custom made, you know, eye cup for a horse. So don't don't be afraid to improvise is, is the point I'm trying to make. And I think the other thing that's really, really important is rest. These horses that have corneal ulcers, they do definitely need to be rested. 
Um, if, you know, when they've got this um, uveitis going on and it's quite severe, if you actually increase the blood pressure, et cetera, within that eye while that, it, that level of inflammation is occurring, they can then end up with, you know, hyphemia and actually hemorrhage and all kinds of complications in there. So it's really, really important that just because you are treating the eye, the owner understands that no, they can't go out um, and ride the horses normally. No, um, next slide, please, Tim. So this is just really just a little bit of a discussion from the bacterial side of things. There are lots of um, antibacterials available and some of this will be as simple as if it's a superficial ulcer and obviously things like um, even fusidic acid, which you will have in small animal practice, will, will be appropriate. But probably the, the, mo the mainstay broad spectrum um, antibiotic or antibacterial for a superficial ulcer is going to be something like chloramphenicol. Um, there obviously are some like, lots of drugs available as well that are probably more uh, accustomed to be put in through lavage systems. Um, Preference a little bit. I generally prefer solutions because they interfere less with corneal um, healing. But equally, ointments can be quite helpful. Say, for example, I only can only do like a couple of times a day. Then that's going to be um, a little bit easier to manage than say putting drops in there. You know, like three or four times a day. Um, next slide, please, Tim. So I'm, just, I'm actually just going to speak a little bit more specifically about uh, fungal ulcers because I think these are really, really important and it's not always obvious that they are fungal, um, these ulcers are fungal in origin. So I think the first thing to bear in mind is, is that a lot, a lot of these fungi are kind of normal microflora or inhabitants, um, you know, on the surface of the cornea or within the conjunctival sac. And so they don't generally cause a lot of problems because, you know, you've got this uh, tear film, you've got the surface of the, the cornea itself. But however, they are quite dangerous from the point of view is that a lot of these are opportunistic pathogens. So if you get any kind of um, even blunt trauma, um, or even disruption of the tear film, a lot of these fungi will actually take advantage of this and produce these proteinases that will um, cause this stromal destruction. And then it kind of escalates from there. They can also pr produce these anti-angiogenic compounds and these kind of slow down or inhibit like the vascularization. And that's really, really important for healing. And they've also got this affinity for the decimus membrane. And this is where you have a real problem because these fungal ulcers can be really, really deep seated and really, really problematic to treat. Um, next slide, please, Tim. And which antifungal is always a bit of a problem, I suppose, especially in the UK, because I think we have less readily available in the UK versus say um, in the States. Uh, and I've put this list up because I think the first thing to note is you can get a lot of these antifungals from hospitals and, and also if you contact a lot of um, sort of referral equine practices or even equine ophthalmologists that offer a referral service, a lot of them will be very helpful in getting these drugs for you or at least coordinating that as are hospitals. Uh, but I think the other thing to mention and the reason I put it on the list is you can actually use um, caniston and these fungal ulcers and also to some extent even silver sulfadiazine um, cream will have some degree of antifungal effect so if you're really desperate you can at least start them on something like silver sulfadiazine if you think you've got a fungal ulcer and you've got evidence of it for example from like a site you know a cytological stain as well and even if you say you can get hold of some caniston that at least is better to start on than uh, you know than not starting any at all and waiting two or three days because these, these fungal ulcers can in particular progress really, really rapidly. Next slide, please, Tim. Um, so if you think you have a fungal ulcer, for example, it's, it's really, really important that you, you, know, you start aggressive um, treatment straight away. Uh, but it's also really, really important that you have that chat with the owner because these, these are types of things that are not going to resolve within a week. In fact, they can, they're probably going to take weeks and weeks of treatment 
um, that are going to be very expensive with, I guess, an uncertain outcome and more than likely some sort of significant degree of corneal scar. OK, so it, it's really, really important that you've got to have an owner on board uh, that's going to be committed to that level of treatment before you start, because there is no quick fix for these. And I think the other thing um, I think that often happens, and I think it's really important if you haven't seen this before, if you haven't used a lot of antifungals in horses and you start them quite often for a couple of days afterwards, the eye will look absolutely awful and you'll start questioning yourself whether you've actually done the right thing. Um, so you, you will get a lot of fungal dieback once you start using the drug. And sadly, a lot of the antifungal drugs that we use are also quite irritant anyway. So you will get some degree of inflammation just by virtue of using them. So it's a, it's a bit of a catch-22 scenario. But I think the only thing I'm trying to do is kind of pre-warn, I suppose, that some of these will actually look worse when you start the antifungal. So don't, don't kind of get um, disheartened by that and think you've gone, you know, you've gone down the wrong route. Uh, next slide, please, Tim. So I think basically something that is just moving on to treatment of corneal ulcers, um, and especially if you've got any kind of melting ulcer, whether you think that's bacteria or fungal in origin, it's really, really important to um, provide these kind of um, anti-collagenase um, treatments as well. And probably the one that's most readily available to everybody, because you can literally just pull blood off the horse and use that, is literally autologous serum. Um, this has a really nice level of this alpha-2 macroglobulin, and this has got this anti-proteinase activity, and it's got this really, really good activity that kind of blocks the action of these uh, metalloproteinases that have, you know, have this marked effect and causes this, uh, causes this melting, this severe melting in a lot of these eyes. Um, and this is really, really easy to do. You literally pull blood off the horse, spin it down and you collect the serum off and you can keep it in the fridge and use it for up to five days. I probably wouldn't use it much beyond that. Um, but equally, if you are treating any kind of ulcer um, that requires serum, you probably are more than likely going to be going out um, you know, every few days anyway. So it's not going to be difficult to replace this and keep it in the fridge. You can also use acetylcysteine or sodium EDTA. Um, you can, interestingly, although I haven't used it in a lot of cases, but if you are struggling and you're thinking you want to try and maybe use something that um, has a little bit of a longer acting effect and the owners might not be able to reliably get, say, get serum into an eye, you can use subconjunctival tetanus antitoxin and it does have this kind of anti-collagenase effect as well. So it's always worth, you know, bearing in mind for one of these cases where um, you might need to pull something a little bit different out your sleeve in terms of treatment. Okay, thanks, Tim. And, and last but not least, because in, in my mind, this, you know, treating the uveitis with these corneal ulcers is really, really important. If you don't get the uveitis under control, um, you're not going to control the inflammation and your horse is going to be incredibly painful and persistent. You're not going to touch the pain if you don't address this. Um, so probably the most important thing with uveitis is you need to make this this you know constricted myotic pupil dilate um, and the main reason that we do this in horses is by using as I'm sure you all do is atropine um, it's got quite a potent prolonged effect in horses uh, but it, it's sort of twofold it does actually make the pupil di dilate directly but it also reduces this ciliary muscle spasm and actually that contributes quite significantly to the pain um, of uveitis as well. So it's kind of twofold in my mind that the atropine works. Initially, until you get that pupil dilated, I try and use this maybe three or four times a day. But as soon as the pupil starts to dilate, um, and then you can back off quite rapidly, even if it's like once a day or every other day. Um, but once you get that, you know, that dilation effect, then you can back off. Obviously, don't forget when you're doing this, it's really, really important that you protect the eye because these horses are going to have a massively dilated pupil that is going to have, you know, it's going to be prolonged, actually. And they're going to be very, very light sensitive. So these horses need to stay in and they ideally need to have some sort of eye protection as well. 
okay? Just be aware that it doesn't happen very often, but you'll always, always get the odd horse that's really, really sensitive to the effects of atropine. So if you are using it for, um, for this reason, just be extra vigilant and make sure the owners are aware of that and to be, you know, on, on kind of extra guard in terms of colic and impactions as well. So the normal things, you know, like passing uh, feces, etc., uh, just to watch that uh, really, really closely. Obviously, um, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs um, are going to feature quite strongly here in terms of controlling your uveitis. Um, you can use you can use but or you can use flanixin. Flanixin actually is, is a little bit better in terms of controlling ocular pain, but the downside slightly is it probably has a little bit more of a uh, inhibitory effect on the sort of vascularization and the healing of the ulcer versus say but. I personally use flanixin because I think it's better and it seems to control the pain better than but. Um, but just bear that in mind from the point of view of healing. Next slide, please, Tim. You can also use um, topical non steroidals. And whilst we are all a little, you know, we'd never put corticosteroids um, in an eye with a corneal ulcer, sometimes if you've in those initial stages or those that first 24 or 48 hours where you've got an incredibly painful horse and it seems that nothing is touching the horse despite, you know, using the atropine, um, systemic non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, you can actually use. Um, topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and probably the main one is flubiprofen uh, which goes under the trade name of Ocufen uh, and that's quite nice as I say just to use in the short term it will have an effect on healing as well but sometimes you've kind of got to prioritize what you know what the main thing is and if you've got an incredibly painful horse even if it means you use that for the first 24 or 48 hours that's okay um, to get the uveitis under control also, just remember as well that doxycycline, you can give this systemically, and this is quite good at having an anti-inflammatory effect. So if you, again, if you've got one of these horribly um, painful melting ulcers, you can also put these, put them on doxycycline at 10 milligrams per kilogram twice daily, and it does help. Obviously, be aware of any um, diarrhea or um, kind of gastrointestinal effects of that as well. All right. Sorry, Luanne, I was just going to say the time is um, okay. coming. I'm, I'm going to do this really, really quickly. Sorry. No Last but not least, there are some surgical options to help. And these are obviously more relevant to um, more severe melting complicated ulcers, not the sort of ulcers that you're going to see, um, hopefully, in the majority of the time. You can buy contact lenses for horses. They're actually quite good, but the most important thing is they need to fit. Otherwise, they're pretty useless. They just come off and it's quite frustrating. But you can use them and you can also use... Um, you know, like a, a temporary, like a lateral tarsal raffi, like suture them to actually keep them in place, just so they stay a, a little bit better in rather than falling out. Next slide, please, Tim. Don't be afraid to do a little bit of debridement on ulcers that don't seem to be healing well. You can get this uh, slightly annoying accumulation of not only necrotic tissue, um, but also the epithelium as well can kind of curl in and become a little bit indolent. So don't be afraid to do bride a little bit. Uh, you can use this, you can use a swab, you can use the blunt side of a blade. Um, obviously you can use more fancy equipment like a diamond burr. Um, you can even do like a grid keratotomy with a small, you know, with a 20 gauge needle and actually scratch the surface of the ulcer to simulate healing. So don't be afraid to do that if you think your, um, your ulcer isn't healing very well. There, are this, oh, there is this option of actually using grafts to help healing. Uh, and I won't go into too much detail other than they can just help where you've, you know, you've got these really, really large, deep or melting ulcers um, or where they're at high risk of perforating. It just kind of makes you sleep better at night. But if you think you put some, some sort of graft on there, it at least get, adds some strength to the cornea. Um, you will get some scarring as a result of using these. Um, and there are a number of grafts that can be used. Some of these are just simple Next slide, please, Tim, from the point of view of a, like just a simple pedicle graft. But there are all kinds of, um, I suppose, orientations that you can use depending on the location of your ulcer, how large it is, etc. And you can get quite inventive and they do work.
quite well, um, as I say, just to reinforce an area, stimulate healing, provide some protection, etc. Particularly in a horse where you might not be able to do as ideal treatment as you might want to. Uh, and you have to, again, might have to think about other options um, to actually treat, you know, treat an ulcer. Just along the same lines, you can also use, you know, things like amnion uh, membrane. Um, some people have used like bladder transplants, et cetera, as well. And these largely form the same uh, function as some of these conjunctival grafts. You will get um, a degree of scarring with all of them. I'm just gonna move on swiftly now. Third eyelid flaps as well, or also temporal tartarophis as well can, you know, can help from the point of view of healing, particularly if you've got a horse that is not very, very amenable to treatment and maybe your um, treatment options are limited, for example. So just worth considering if you, again, if you've got to think of something else that might work for these horses, this might be something that you could apply, you know, in the field and actually go back and, um, check periodically rather than you know having to sort of medicate them overly frequently uh, so I think the take take home points are obviously corneal ulcers are common uh, unfortunately horses are predisposed because of the, the sort of eye you know their prominent eye positions um, just bear in mind that some of these can become or can be more complicated than they initially appear especially if you think you've got fungal involvement important to not only treat the infection but also the uveitis um, and also just bear in mind that you need to address all these proteinases as well that have like not only inflammatory but also uh, a destructive effect with, uh, within the eye okay and I think that's probably my the end of my talk so this is actually I thought I'd put this up as my question slide so this is this is actually how this horse ended up so it's not obviously a pretty eye. It does have a significant scar. But considering this, ho this horse had a questionable outcome from the point of view of having even actually being able to maintain its eye, um, this horse kind of teetered for quite a long time on the verge of a nucleation. Uh, and this is how she is now. And she's quite comfortable. And she's kind of got probably 60% vision in that eye. She does have a, you know, like, a, I guess, a blind spot from where all the scar tissue is. Um, I guess I'm trying to just say that you can actually salvage even the worst looking eyes if you've got the commitment, the time and the money. OK, thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Joanne. And, and also, if you've got some bras lying around is what I understand. So, uh, yeah, yep, utilise them. They work really well, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, the <laughs> great. Thank you very much. Um, time is, 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 is on us. But is there any anybody got any burning questions uh, they would like to ask? Uh, now is the time, although I'm quite sure if people would like to contact you at Vernwee, is there any email address that they can get hold of you guys for further discussion and advice? I think our email addresses are on the, you know, on the front slide. I think Tim, yours is on there as well, isn't it? Is Tim there? Yeah, maybe you can't hear me. My email address is definitely on there anyway, if anybody wants to get in touch. And if it's obviously something that... Um, requires more of a discussion than I can if they leave you know if they actually send the contact details and I can always call and have a chat about something. Brilliant thank you very much um, just a very quick one you, you mentioned the fungus but you also mentioned bacteria what are, are there any common bacteria that are found or is it primarily for the culture that you do the bacteriology? Um, no I mean it's, it's always worthwhile doing you know you can do the culture even if it's um, not even strictly speaking a culture you just do cytology that dictates gram negative or gram positive I mean a lot of these are commensals you know that are in the environment so you're going to have a lot of streptococci and things like that so just ordinary kind of like skin um, commensals that are in the you know in the tear film and on the surface of the bacteria are in and the conjunctival fornix etc so streptococci staphylococci you know that they're, they're fairly common obviously you can also get things like the pseudomonas um so just be aware because they can be a little bit tricky when it comes to drug selection and there is obviously resistance problems as i'm sure it's the same with small animals isn't it so yeah that's brilliant. Thank you very much. And, and Tim has put the, um, the email addresses for Tim and Luran in the chat there. So um, if anybody wants to take them down, I'm going to draw this evening to a close and say thank you very much uh, to Vern Wee for lending us Tim and Luran. Thanks very much, guys, for your contributions. And also, because this is the very last one for 2021, I'd just like to thank 
uh, all the speakers. So we had Sue Patterson in the first one talking about dermatology in small animals and in horses. We had Daryl Abernathy talking about um, epidemiology. Uh, and I actually wish I'd paid more attention in vet school now because uh, mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Um, uh, Emma Gerard talked about infection control in the practice. And of course, we've now had Tim and Luan uh, talking about uh, wounds and corneas. So thank you to all our speakers. Uh, thank you uh, to the sponsor. Thank you also to um, the organisers for, for getting this together. And hopefully we can all meet you face to face for Vets Cymru 2022 next year. If you've got any ideas or things that you'd like to um, to see in that, then please um, email us. You can contact me. I, I work at the Wales Veterinary Science Centre. I realised I didn't introduce myself. So sorry. I'm John King, the manager of the Wales Veterinary Science Centre. Uh, and with the BSAVA, we've been bringing you Vets Cymru. So thank you very much and uh, have a good evening, everybody. Thank you.